Hello, my name is Nika Bollet. I'm a clinical psychologist and I work at the outpatient service for um, rehabilitation of people with chronic pain. Um, it's a part of the University Rehabilitation Institute of Slovenia. I have a really great privilege to work with a wonderful team of pain specialists, that means um, medical doctors specializing in phys physical and rehabilitation medicine and occupational therapists, social workers, clinical psychologists, and also physiotherapists. And um, the role of physiotherapy, a physiotherapist in uh, chronic pain management is so important because you want the patient to remain physically active in spite of chronic pain. Um, so this lecture is really meant for physiotherapists or um, professors of physiotherapy and students of physiotherapy. And because it's titled Challenges in Blah Blah, uh, of course I'm going to be talking about problems because, because um, challenges is such a politically correct word for, for problems, isn't it? Um, I, I really hope that I'll be able to um, deliver the purpose of this lecture, which is understand the challenges or problems that physiotherapists face when working with people with chronic pain and really make you understand how come these challenges occur and um, make you think about how we can maybe better equip physiotherapists and also physiotherapy students to deal with these challenges in their practice or their future practice. But before we really delve um, into all of that, um, I want you to, to really think about your own experience. Perhaps you were drawn to this lecture or wanted to listen to it because you really have these frustrations um, that you have experienced maybe one time, maybe several times when treating chronic pain patients, or maybe if you don't work in um, physiotherapy practice, Maybe you have heard about frustrations from your colleagues that do. So when you think about it, try to think about which areas of connecting with a chronic pain patient seem to be the most problematic in your uh, practice, or if you don't have a practice yet, uh, you believe would be problematic. So maybe, you know, you can pause this lecture and really think about this. And, um, then we can, I guess, go on. So before we go further in this topic, I really want to talk to you about a dream I had um, months ago. Um, this dream was really, uh, it was quite a bad dream. It was nightmarish. Um, and I think it was definitely connected with the way I handled uh, one therapy session um, I, I offer group psychotherapy in the context of interdisciplinary rehabilitation uh, for chronic pain patients. And uh, at that moment, I was working with two groups of patients, and um, one group was doing really fine that day, and the other group was sort of, sort of distant and lost in their thoughts. And especially one of the patients, I, I, I think he was really sort of indisposed. And what I would usually do as a clinical psychologist, um, I would definitely inquire, you know, what's going on, what's um, rushing through their minds or if they want to share. At that time, I did not do that. And the reason I didn't was because that time I had this huge plan on what I was going to do in that session, which was really time limited and it was highly structured. So when, when the session was over, I saw that, you know, the group was kind of fine. I mean, seemed fine. The people seemed satisfied with the, um, with the session and um, definitely talked about, okay, we acquired some new skills and this was really helpful and it's going to make us think about something. 
and uh, even you know the the patient that was so indisposed um you know he was less indisposed after the um after the session ended but still i somehow i did not feel good you know because i felt maybe i should maybe i really should address the elephant in the room you know just ask them what's up so that brings us to the actual dream uh first i needed to give you this context um so this dream looked like this um all of the patients all of these patients uh, in my group they were together in a session with me and i was not really doing psychotherapy i was really more like giving them a lecture on what they have to do you know in order to better manage their chronic pain so i was talking in this paternalistic tone uh, which is not very typical of me as a in the role of a psychotherapist. So the reaction of the patients was one by one, you know, they started leaving, getting up from their chairs and just left the room. And they seemed really angry with me. They didn't really say anything, but they looked so disappointed and upset. And I, I remember specifically one of the patients uh, was this um, woman with uh, this huge brown big brown eyes and uh, she was just looking at me with those big brown eyes and she kind of reminded me of Bambi you know the cartoon character and I just felt oh my god I, I disappointed Bambi Bambi is really angry with me and that felt so awful uh, so when I woke up, it was just this terrible feeling. Um, and I think what, the reason I felt so terrible about it was, I think I really lost the connection that I had with my patients. And, um, and the consequence of that was, you know, if I cannot connect with them, then I cannot help them. And that, that was a nightmare for me. So we have we need to connect with our patients i mean connecting is a very basic need for all of us in our private lives and at work as well you know i mean we spend so much time at work and especially when we work with people um, we have this need uh, even more so when we work with people that need help and we are the ones that can provide it um, with their cooperation, of course. And this word connection, really, I, I am so inspired to use it uh, because of a lecture that I heard years ago. It was uh, actually at EFIC in 2017, um, which was in uh, Copenhagen in Denmark, a wonderful congress. And um, there I, I listened to this uh, French um, physician and rheumatologist called uh, Serge Perrault. And he gave this wonderful, wonderful lecture on fibromyalgia and he introduced it as a concept, um, as a syndrome of disconnection on so many levels. And he was talking about, you know, it's a disconnection between brain and the body but it's also a disconnection for for a person, you know, between um, their bodies and themselves. And finally, uh, uh, there's this huge disconnect between the person and their physician, or or the person, the patient, and some other health worker. So it's a disconnection on many levels, and um, it's just you know runs through it and the thing is you know this good self-management of chronic pain really um, can be achieved when patients and professionals connect so when their connections are effective and when they can collaborate and integrate um, because each have some knowledge and 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 skills and you know the patient is the best expert in their experience of pain and uh, the health workers are experts in chronic pain management so when i say that health workers are experts in chronic pain management i mean you know they 
know a lot about it, except when they actually know very little about it. So there's a problem or challenge, shall we say, and uh, let's talk about that. I want to direct you to this very interesting study by uh, Ali and Thompson. So they did this um, study where they compared the knowledge of chronic pain and how it's managed between final year physiotherapy and medical students. A very interesting study. I really recommend you read it. So one of the important things that they found out is that the problem um, seems to be that uh, final year medical students and final year physiotherapy students really have this uh, curative orientation to chronic pain. So they believe that chronic pain can be cured. Um, they gave them a questionnaire um, which included two sections. So one was how much they know of chronic pain and one was how much they know about management of chronic pain. So physiotherapy students um, had greater knowledge of chronic pain, but medical students um, had more knowledge of the management of um, chronic pain. But there was, there, uh, was found to be a great um, lack of understanding uh, in varying degrees, of course, of a very important concept of central sensitization, fear avoidance, um, opioid addiction, and all of them, you know, the, the both cohorts had this curative orientation. So that's a pretty huge problem, uh, because if you believe that, you're going to want to cure this um, patients, but then you'll be frustrated because you will not be able to do it. Um, so this study also measured attitudes of physiotherapists because uh, it's not all about knowledge, it's also about attitudes. Of course, uh, how much you know about it, it, um, it also affects how much uh, or what kind of attitude you're going to have towards a certain clinical population. So they, uh, I just want to, you know, show which um, questionnaire uh, questionnaires are quite useful for measuring these attitudes, especially this uh, first two in this slide, you know, pain attitudes and beliefs scale for physiotherapists and um, pain and impairment relationship scale, which was actually uh, originally designed for patients, but is now also being um, used for health professionals. The third one is the Tampa scale for kinesiophobia. We use it in our practice as well. Um, and it's uh, designed to measure fear of movement, so it can be quite um, useful to to see if a uh, if a patient has lost their trust in whether they can do you know movement in their body and be relaxed about this movement. Uh, one of the questions that they posed to students was also, do you think that some people are more prone to getting chronic pain? And um, they wanted them to state briefly um, the reasons for their answer. And here you have um, the categories um, of these answers. And um, I, I highlighted in red those that were quite problematic. So um, a lot of these students thought that people that are hypochondriacs or malingerers or are old or are fat women, you know, you see at the bottom, are more prone uh, to getting chronic pain. And um, these are quite problematic answers, you know, because they, they are simply not true. So um, this has nothing to do with uh, being a malingerer or how much you're old. You know, you, you get a lot of patients uh, that are very young and a lot of the time they get this response from physicians or other health workers that, oh, you're too young to have pain. And on the other side, older people, you know, they are told, well, you're old, so that's why you have pain and nothing is really done about it or too little is done about it. So that's a huge problem. 
Um, and there were these contemptuous responses which just should not be uttered by uh, medical professionals at all. So, you know, 2% of medical students answer that it's fat women who get chronic pain. All right. So, like I said before, you know, lack of knowledge uh, can lead to unhelpful attitudes and belief about chronic pain and chronic pain patients. Uh, and then people, you know, health workers are just going to be frustrated when they're going to try to help the patient. I do believe that uh, health professionals want to help, but when they don't know how, um, it's sort of like a vicious circle because they can blame the patient for unsuccessful treatment quite quickly. So that brings me to my own experience. I really want to talk to you about it because um, I think I've been telling this story for, for ages now, I think. And um, this exchange that, that you see on the slide is actually what was the time when I first heard of the word fibromyalgia. I was still a psychology student and um, I, I was doing my uh, psychology practice, um, so I was going to this health institute um, and, um, you know, working with, with my mentor, um, uh, sitting in when, when she was doing um, diagnostics or therapy. And I remember one day inside uh, walks a woman, you know, looking very frail and uh, tired. And she uh, has this um, medical documentation that says she has fibromyalgia. And I, I look at my mentor before the woman walks in, of course, and I ask her, what's fibromyalgia? I never heard of this word. And my mentor had this theatrical reaction, you know, rolling her eyes and saying, oh, it's a disease that does not exist at all. And they just give this diagnosis to people that no longer wish to work. So, you know, she was an authority figure, so I did not really question what she said. So, so I just said, you know, oh, yeah, OK, then. All right, fine. Uh, so that was my first experience with fibromyalgia. And then years later, I was uh, looking for a new job. I really wanted to get back into healthcare uh, once more. And uh, I applied to work at the institute I work at now uh, for several times. And finally, I was successful. And, um, you know, guess what? I, I got a job in the chronic pain department. Yay. So um, so I, I had a conversation with my friend uh, that day. And she was like, oh, so how did it go? You know, jo the job interview. And I was like, well, you know, I uh, got the job. And she was like, you know, ecstatic. Oh, congratulations. That's wonderful. Um, and I started crying. I was really, I was crying because I got this job and she did not understand it at all. And she said, okay, you don't seem very happy about it. And I was like, yeah, because, you know, I'll be working with people with chronic pain. And uh, she not being a health worker, you know, was like, yeah, well, why is that a problem? And I was like, yeah, but well, you know, these are people that uh, don't really have real diseases. They are fake diseases. And it's only really people that don't want to work anymore, you know. So what am I going to do with them? They're, they'll just yammer. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, all right, I, I got the job, but, you know, um, give it a few months and I'll just you know, skedaddle to, to some other depart department, maybe something with um, like brain trauma or something that has actual health problems, you know, not fake ones. But uh, you know what? Something miraculous happened. Um, months went by and uh, I began to listen to, to people with chronic pain. And um, I really got to know the people and the diagnosis but mostly people. Uh, and it just really, it was quite transformative. It was very important uh, experience to allow myself to just get to know these people and uh, realize, of course, also get some real knowledge about chronic pain. That was pretty helpful. So, 
so now you know I wouldn't I wouldn't change uh, this job at all I mean I, I wouldn't want to work anywhere else and um, but the experience that I had um, really got me interested in the area of chronic pain patient stigma um, you know stigmatization is something where you apply this one um, characteristic to people and you don't really want to know the people at all the person at all you just see them through this lens of one thing you know and um, so I, uh, I I had this um, how do you call them lectures workshops actually they were workshops for healthcare workers and um, mainly physiotherapists and uh, physicians visited them but also you know nurses psychologists and i always posed them this one question which was sort of made to elicit these negative automatic thoughts so i asked them you know when you think of a chronic pain patient what thought or it can be an image um, goes through your mind and the answer answers were really interesting um so you know about 10 percent of health workers were saying oh these are just the patients that complain they yammer so these are the examples of the answers you know this is just many complaints about feeling bad yammering um, just keeps on complaining, exaggerates, and you know, raising some suspicions by that. You know, I wonder, is it really that painful? One of them thought. And um, you know, thinking really, these people feel sorry for themselves. A few of them were focusing on the fact that these are difficult patients. Um, this is really best represented by the second answer. He'll be in my office for a long time. It's going to take up so much of my time and I'm not sure of the effect. There's also the physical aspect. So how do health workers see those uh, patients? You know, okay, they, they're like crouching or walking with a limp or walking slowly they make this facial uh, grimace they have a certain body movement um, one of them said I wish there was some imaging technique that could confirm this and I specifically remember that a neurosurgeon wrote this one so maybe now I would direct you on this slide that you know below um, the slide below the um, statement you have this pointer and below it says belief so what i want to say by this is that the way we think about chronic pain patients these thoughts doesn't just come from the clear blue sky i mean it comes out of our beliefs so what do we really believe about chronic pain patients you know that's what forms this um these statements and i'll be talking about this uh, topic later on um, about 15 percent of uh, health care workers um, were sort of suspicious about this patient's personal or moral integrity so they felt they were not determined enough or brave to cope with their problems or they were you know one of these said that these pa patients are addicted to suffering and just feel sorry for themselves and again there's this suspicion i wonder does it really hurt that bad but this um, category wanting to alleviate suffering this one really put a smile on my face uh, because it was um, chosen by it was focused on by uh, almost 41 percent of all the healthcare workers that were asked this question and it showed this wish this desire by healthcare workers that they want to help these patients 
I mean, I do believe that the values of healthcare workers, um, in spite of sometimes stigmatizing these patients, is to actually help. They just maybe don't know how. And it can lead to a lot of frustrations and pretty bad attitudes. So this category, yeah, that's that's a nice one. Yeah. So these people do need help. I wonder how I, I can help them. I cannot really help, cannot take away the pain. But this patient, it, he needs our, my help, protection. Well, this one is, um, again, sort of contemptuous, like um, in that study of uh, students. So who are these patients anyway? Um, and you can see, you know, that um, a couple of healthcare workers think that this can only happen to older, um, frustrated women. So that's not a very nice thing to say, is it? So this uh, workshop that um, I did with healthcare workers, the first thing I did was elicit these answers. And then I talk, spoke to them about how come you, we, we have this as healthcare workers, how come we have these um, beliefs about these patients. And I really wanted to offer them an opportunity to identify these beliefs and attitudes and views and make them think about how it affects them and their therapeutic alliances and make them understand where this all comes from. Um, also to, to make them think about what the consequences are for the patients and for themselves as well, because if you are not satisfied, if you, you, are, you keep getting frustrated with your patients, um, yeah, that's not a good feeling, is it? Also, what was really important in this workshop was that um, there was no judgment. I mean, you should not judge um, healthcare workers because they have unhelpful attitudes. I believe it's much more helpful to make them identify them and think about them. And like I said, the majority of them really want to help these patients. So. Um, I think the best course of action is to, to help them do that. So then we sort of did this um, reverse sort of study where we asked our patients in, in our department, um, we asked them, when you think of having to visit your physician because of your pain, what thought or image goes through your mind? And um, so here are the answers. 30% of them felt quite misunderstood and wonder, you know, will he understand? How do I explain myself so I'll be understood? And feeling, you know, quite sad because um, the doctor, they felt the doctors um, thought they're making this up. Um, so quite a lot of people were quite apprehensive of going to the doctors, to, to their physicians, because, um, you know, when you go to, the, to your doctor, you um, expect to be believed, you know. Um, a similar number of people, 29% uh, were focusing on the emotional aspect. So how it feels to go to the physician. You know, they said, OK, I'm afraid or this is going to be another effed up day. And um, why me? I'm sad. Um, makes no sense to go. You know, the doctor can't help me anyway. Or this is going to be an unpleasant conversation. Again, not something that you want to experience when you go to your doctor. Some of them focused on the physical aspect of pain, how, how it aches, how their body aches, um, you know, just wondering what's wrong with my body, which is a common concern for uh, chronic pain patients, especially in the beginning before the diagnosis is, is given. Some of them were thinking about drugs, oh, you know, will I get drugs, will I actually get drugs that help? Um, 
you know, hoping um, to to get a drug that helps, um, not not something that is, you know, just painkillers. Um, or, you know, hoping to, to get introduced to some other options besides drugs. A small percent of them were thinking about their sick leave. So, you know, um, quite, uh, quite, you know, very, very small number of them were really thinking about, you know, will I get sick leave? And it doesn't mean they wanted to have it. You know, some of them thought something like, I'll be Emory at work, I will have to defend myself. This is not a pleasant experience. Uh, they, you know, they feel sad because once again, they're limited regarding my work. So that really runs um, quite contra to the stereotype that these are the people that don't want to work in our, our um, practice. Certainly, um, that's not something that we observe. So now you really get to this question that I was talking um, to you about prior. So how come that chronic pain elicits such responses that we saw from healthcare workers? What is it about chronic pain that elicits such responses? So, you know, chronic pain just seems to have this incredible bad luck. You know, because it breaks so many norms and values and the expectations that we have or appreciate in, in our society. So one of them definitely is the ability to work. Um, because, you know, there's this feeling, do, do these people still contribute to society? Because some of them cannot work. So even though nobody maybe explicitly talks about it, but at least implicitly, you know, we are sort of suspicious of people that um, are on sick leave and they look just fine, which is something that many chronic people uh, do look just fine. Um, also, a lot of the chronic pain patients suffer from depression or anxiety. So there's this high psychiatric comorbidity. And, uh, you know, when you, when you get that as well, you know, many people think, oh, it's, it's all in the head anyway. You know, if people don't uh, are not depressed, then there's going to be no pain either. Uh, some of them are addicted to painkillers, especially opioids, um, and um, that can bring bring some stigmatization as well. Uh, one of the main problems, really, with uh, chronic pain is that the uh, pathogenesis is unclear. So when you have, you don't have this very understandable um, reason and way how this is all happening, you know, a lot of medical professionals are going to say, so, okay, it must be all in the head. And this is something, if you look at medical anthropology, this is something that has been happening a lot of the times with many diseases, which later were found out to have very clear organic um, pathogenesis. Um, also, mo most patients are women. And uh, again, going, going back to the medical anthropology knowledge, um, many diseases in the history were quite well diagnosed in men, but in women they were attributed to um, hysteria. For example, multiple sclerosis was one of those diseases. Um, a huge problem also is the line of thought, the school of thought that is prevalent in our society, which is the mind-body dualism. So that goes back, I think, more than 300 years. You know, it goes back to René Descartes, the a famous philosopher, and he was the one that disconnected the mind and the body. So when it comes to diseases, you know, it must either be in the body or in the mind. So if we cannot find a clear bodily reason, then it must be in the head. So the problem is, you know, there's no objective proof um, of chronic pain. So, you know, logically, it must be a disease of the mind. Um, also, there's this, um, you know, the way healthcare works in our society. 
I mean, for the past few decades, you know, everybody had their mouths full of the biopsychosocial model. You know, we understand um, diseases um, in this through the lens of the biopsychosocial model. We talk about it a lot. We write about it a lot. But in reality, uh, we are still very much a biomedical society. If you look at our healthcare, it's how most of healthcare works. Um, so, you know, even though there are so many evidence, there's so much evidence of the effectiveness of working, treating diseases in a biopsychosocial way, a lot of them are still treated in a biomedical way. So that gives a wrong message to patients. And it also keeps uh, many healthcare workers trapped in this line of thinking. Well, that's a problem. So we we come to the to the issue that um, I get these questions all the time by uh, psychology students. Um, every time I lecture about chronic pain. So is the pain real or is it not real? Um, you know, today I'm not going to talk about uh, the realness of pain. We all know that chronic pain, of course, is very much real. Um, but what what is the co consequence of asking ourselves this question? Uh, we, if we do that, we are really asking ourselves about the moral integrity or the character of this uh, patient. Uh, does this patient maybe have some hidden purpose or some agenda? And also, if we think about, okay, it's all in the head, um, then the, the logical consequences of this is, all right, it's all in the head. So that means you just have to change what's in your head. So what is in your head? Oh, it's your thoughts. So if you change your thoughts, um, you're going to be fine. So why don't you do that? So what we're really saying is, you know, is chronic pain somehow voluntary? You just have to change the way you think. That's something that a lot of chronic pain patients, sadly, um, are still faced with. Um, or it's it's um, not just um, in healthcare, also a lot of the time in their environment, uh, in their families, co-workers and such. It's a very highly unpleasant situation to be in. And uh, yeah, this is uh, sort of like um, another unpleasant thing for these patients. They raise suspicions when they look good. Um, so, you know, chronic pain is something that does not really show on the body. And, um, you know, these people, they look just fine on the outside. So uh, when they do not do their share of the work, they are not work productive, uh, they're on sick leave, you know, it's like, why? I mean, she looks fine. There's nothing wrong with her. And another, you know, offending thing to, to healthy people is that, um, why is this person having a good time? Why don't they just sit at home? Why don't they just wallow in misery? You know, how come they're having fun or laughing or going to the theater if, um, you know, they're so sick? Uh, this is something that uh, I'm quite unhappy about because I also encounter it in my um, uh, own institute, you know, um, because we have this many people that um, walk the many patients that walk our corridors and, you know, they're together in a group, you know, between therapy sessions and, you know, they're having a good time. Uh, isn't that a good thing? Don't we want the patients to feel good? Uh, but I see how other health workers that do not work at my department, how they sometimes react, you know, they're like, yeah, this, you know, fibro people just walk the corridors and have a good time. Come on. But it does happen. Also, another thing that um, makes um, or provokes healthcare workers into thinking that this is all about malingering. Uh, or being a hypochondriac 
or not wanting to work is that um, many patients do not really understand the visual analog scale, so the VAS. Um, so um, being a chronic pain patient, you really better get that uh, number correct if you don't want to anger uh, the healthcare worker, right? But the thing is why they usually get this number wrong. They don't get adequate, adequately familiar with the scale. They need time to really understand it. And many times the question um, posed by this scale is not really well uh, explained. So what healthcare workers really need um, is to take many contexts into account that um, are involved in giving you the VAS number. So these are experiential, the cultural, the motivational context. So I remember being a clinical psychology resident and uh, for a couple of months working in this pediatric department. And uh, one, one night this boy came to the department saying that he had so much pain. And the nurse asked him, so how much on a scale from zero to 10? And he said, you know, um, 10, of course, it's a 10. And then a couple of hours uh, later uh, at the rapport with uh, the rest of the workers, she was telling this story and she was like so angry with the boy. She was saying, you know, he, he had the guts to tell me that it's a 10 out of 10 and all the while he was eating a sandwich and everybody there was laughing and i was like did anybody even begin to think that maybe this boy said 10 because this of course was the most intense pain he has ever felt in his life so that's a experiential context that influenced the number that he gave on the on the scale there's also the cultural context. I mean, certain cultures simply appreciate people talking about pain. It's just a cultural thing. So a, a lot of the people uh, do not talk about their inner worlds, as in this, these are my feelings or that's you know what I'm dealing with. But when it comes to uh, symptoms, they are encouraged to talk about it. So they're gonna say everything hurts, it's all the same all the time, you know, it's a 11 out of 10, you know, and it's because of culture, not because the person is trying to trick you. Um, and also the motivational context, um, it's a problem when people feel the need to aggravate their pain. Um, a lot of the times, it's not because the uh, patient is trying to trick you. Um, a lot of the time is because maybe they have, in the past, not been believed so many times. When they said, oh, it's a, you know, three or four or five or six. So now they think, I really have to say it's a 10 out of 10. So anybody will just, somebody will, will take me seriously. So really uh, what we do in our department, you know, we take time to really explain the visual analog scale. And uh, in the beginning of the rehabilitation, many people, you know, they just overestimate their um, pain level greatly, but that's what rehabilitation is for, you know, to really be able to, to assess what's really going on in your body. So you need, you just need time for it. You need some, understanding and uh, health workers, it's, it's good uh, to be um, patient and really explain this and not hurry it too much. I know it's not possible in all contexts, of course, but uh, because it's not possible, maybe you should give the patients the benefit of a doubt. Um, a lot of this brings the chronic pain patients to this dilemma. Do I speak of my pain or do I read or not? Um, it, you know, for people, they are a lot of the time afraid to talk about it because then they will be seen as different. 
you know, stand, stand it out from the crowd. And um, it's not a very pleasant thing. And possibly they will um, look morally suspicious. So also, you know, when people see that maybe people are questioning the realness of their pain or of their pain, they're just going to clam up. And um, that's just going to lead to more feelings of shame. And it's really all this double negative loop. You know, because there's no way to win this. If you speak up, you raise a suspicion. You know, okay, she is speaking up about having pain all the time, every day. So that maybe really means that maybe she wants to wa avoid work. But if the person is quiet, that means that they're gonna have to work much harder to get the same results as a healthy person working but you know nobody's gonna know it and they're not gonna be appreciate appreciated for it you know that that's a tragedy so there's this terrible cost of keeping up appearances that everything is fine um you know it's uh i don't i don't believe uh, any any uh, situation is good for them. You know, the problem for the chronic pain patient is that really they only have this one tool on how to communicate their problem, and it's talking about it. So what the social studies of chronic pain show is that chronic pain patients are systematically invalidated so they are not seen as credible or legitimate and like i said that pertains to all environments whether it be friends family co-workers healthcare workers and in order to be taken seriously i mean their only truly effective tool or sometimes not very effective is to say they are in pain um not all doctor shopping is really doctor shopping you know sometimes it's really just a cry for help you know please somebody believe me um, our, our culture, you know, does not want people to keep saying that they're in pain. You know, we, we keep calm and we carry on. Um, and, you know, like I said, this is their only tool. So keep keeping talking about it is necessary in order to actually get the proper treatment. But, of course, it also carries with it the risk of being accused of yammering or, or being emotionally um, unstable. Uh, what's really interesting in therapy is that, you know, many times when people come on their first visit to our department, so they talk about pain and um, we uh, take great care in not judging this and just letting them speak about it. And by the end of the examinations, many times people say, oh my God, fun, I found the, the a good place for me the right place for me where you don't you don't really disbelieve me i mean i feel believed um and uh this is really um it's called uh, the need to to validate these patients um it really should be the first step in dealing with the chronic pain patients so listen to them do not judge them and just get to know them you know, it's not all about the diagnosis, it's, it's about the person that has it. Let the people speak about their pain. Be accepting of it. Um, in our practice, by the end of rehabilitation, many times patients simply do not work about, uh, do not talk about pain anymore. It's because they don't need to. They have used that tool they have been believed and now they are focusing on what they can do about it so not so much need to talk about it anymore more need to talk about the important things in life that maybe they have been missing because of dealing with pain so a lot of the times you know in, in group psychotherapy by the end you know the, the word pain is not uttered at all And, you know, every patient needs to be validated. For most of them, it's a given, you know, no questions asked. 
um, if they are not validated, it leads to, um, like Serge Perot would say, to broken connections. It also leads to prolonged care, um, and often the outcomes are quite ineffective. But validated patients, they relax, they know they're believed, and they can easily turn their attention to managing their pain. So the Patient-Therapist Alliance, um, this is increasingly considered in the context of chronic pain physiotherapy. Uh, the concept of the Patient Therapist Alliance, it originates from the psychotherapy, uh, from the spe unspecific factors of psychotherapy. So getting a good alliance with the patient is the unspecific factor that makes the psychotherapy um, effective, successful. So it's not that, you know, therapy is only effective because you have this specific therapeutic techniques. Um, a significant portion of the clin clinical outcome is explained by unspecific factors and the patient therapist relationship or the therapeutic alliance, as we call it, is very, very a uh, huge factor in this. Well, the thing is, you know, the physiotherapists are often quite insecure when managing people with, um, in this study, chronic low back pain. Um, so, um, you know, their, their confidence in treating people that also maybe have some comorbid psychological problems is uh, very important if the physiotherapist does not believe in his uh, effectiveness, it's gonna, um, it's really gonna affect the alliance. Um, a lot of physiotherapists, when they treat their patients, um, you know, they think about the strength of the muscles or flexibility of the body, but a lot of the time, it's not just that, it's not just muscles and joints, you know, it's also other psychological factors um, like self-efficacy. You know, the patients really need to get to the point where they believe they are efficacious, self-efficacious in treating, in managing their own chronic pain. And the physiotherapist has such a key role in this. Um, so, um, especially you know when you work with clinical populations that experience systematic discrimination like chronic pain patients you must as a physiotherapist recognize this so recognize that there's going to be this interplay between this factor and also mental health and the way pain um, uh, pain is managed or you're, you're able to manage it together with the patient. So we, we come back to the biopsychosocial model in physiotherapy. Um, several studies show that physiotherapists are actually quite well aware that chronic pain is a multidimensional by nature. Um, there are many factors uh, affecting it but they just don't feel prepared to utilize that. Um, they feel they have this lack of practical knowledge and experience, and they're also quite uncertain of their role. They, they feel quite limited in their competence. Um, the fact is they're also sometimes time limited. So um, maybe even if they do address some psychological factors, they cannot be uh, effective um, at it because of the um, time limit. So it's also very important to address fears of what the expectations are of the physiotherapist. Just because um, a physiotherapist is going to address something that is psychological by nature, um, so this is, we're talking about psychologically informed psycho physiotherapy now, um, that does not mean that uh, um, a physiotherapist is now a psychologist, so that he needs to work as a psychologist. He is still a physiotherapist, but he is much more confident in tackling some issues 
that can um, you know either uh, faci facilitate or be an obstacle in how they work with this patient and how effective this treatment is going to be. So the implementation of the behavioral medicine is uh, quite challenging in physiotherapy. And um, there are a lot of determin determinants that um, are, are present in this process. One of them is, you know, simply the ambivalence toward this approach because it's, it's so much easier to just de see the uh, physical side of problems, isn't it? Um, so a lot of physiotherapists, you know, maybe still very much apply the biomedical focus. I've got some, uh, I've got some statements about this from this interesting study by Fritz and others. So uh, it's, it's about the complexity of integrating this by uh, behavioral medicine approach into physiotherapy. So this is um, uh, another article that is very much worth reading. A lot of the physiotherapists are quite embarrassed um, talking about uh, psychosocial factors um, and really try to close these themes when the patient brings it up. Um, and that can really be a factor in sort of breaking this patient um, therapist alliance. Um, also, like I said, they, they feel quite ill-equipped um, about applying skills in the, in the behavioral medicine manner. And it's just easier to just, you know, talk about knees, you know, or, or shoulders. Uh, also, uh, a lot of the time, the pedagogical skills are lacking. Uh, that can be a problem. A lot of the times the physiotherapists are actually um, not self-aware enough. They maybe think that they're applying their treatment in a behavioral medicine way, but um, when they're faced with the um, video sequence, when they are taped, and sometimes they realize, oh my God, I'm not really doing this at all. Um, now I want to go to the to some of the uh, treatment um, mo uh, modes on uh, what's important in dealing with chronic pain patients uh, as a physiotherapist. And um, one of them is uh, motivational interviewing. Um, this is not, of course, uh, part of the traditional physiotherapy for any condition, um, and um, but it, you know, the the review and meta analysis shows um, that it is quite effective when you add it to traditional physiotherapy, and it does increase physical activity uh, and um, adherence to exercise prescriptions. So it does, it can help adherence to exercise. It improves self-efficacy, which like we said, is very important for these patients because what they are taught, these new skills, uh, the way to be relaxed in their movement and uh, regular in their movement um, is something that they will have to do continuously for a really long time in order to be successful in the management of their pain. Um, so uh, the effects of using motivational interviewing are small to moderate, which is the case with um, usually the case with such um, uh, soft skills, um, but not very successful in the long term. Which again is um, to be understood because you know to to have something be really successful in the long term, um, you really need to still sort of be in touch um, with this, um, maybe not with the same physiotherapist, but, you know, uh, like in psychotherapy, 
uh, you have these boosters, you have booster sessions. So even when the symptoms like, let's say of depression have been um, managed, well managed, you know, it's really not good to just finish the session. Um, it's good to still sometimes from time to time see the patient and really try to boost their skills and encourage them to keep doing what works for them. So many times in healthcare, this is not possible, especially I think for physiotherapists. Um, so in healthcare, it would be really a great idea to offer um, more booster programs. There is still not much evidence or the evidence that um, there is, is quite poor. Um, the quality of um, research is not, is not that great. But, you know, in, um, like, for example, in uh, alcohol or uh, other substance abuse, this is a very important thing, you know, to still keep doing the, the treatment, but in other ways and still support it somehow by professionals. Um, okay. Maybe another a few words about what motivational interviewing really is and what it really isn't. Uh, like I said, this is something that has been tested quite a lot in certain patient populations, not just in alcohol and other substance abuse, but also in obesity, cancer, arthritis. It's not really this, this is not psychotherapy, okay? This is not treatment or a treatment component. It's really sort of the way you speak to the patient. It's the way you communicate with him or her. And it must be skillfully integrated throughout the treatment. And when you work in a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary setting, uh, it really is helpful if all therapists master the most motivational interviewing skills so the effects of treatment are optimized. Then there's the cognitive behavioral therapy, which is um, really the only evidence-based psychotherapy for chronic pain. And, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is, is really um, the principles of it can be incorporated into many physiotherapists practice. It's just a part of the biopsychosocial uh, approach to treating chronic pain. And also the contextual form of CBT, or uh, it's the so-called acceptance and commitment therapy that's been increasingly used in pain centers uh, in our practice as well. And it has a growing evidence based in chronic pain. Um, it um, teaches people how to engage in things that are important to them. So like goal oriented actions, even in the presence of ongoing pain. And this is achieved by increasing their psychological fl flexibility. That basically means that, so when you're faced with a problem, usually people have a limited set of ways on how to handle the problem, but the more you are psychologically flexible, the more strategies you're going to find in how to deal with the problem, not just the one that is, you know, the first one that pops into your mind. Because a lot of the time, because chronic pain is something that is so in contraintuitive, it's not logical at all. Um, the first thing that pops into your mind is not going to be a very good idea, you know, because when you're in pain, uh, a lot of the time you're going to act like you're in acute pain. You know, so you're going to act like, OK, I, I guess I need to rest because, you know, my grandmother said I should rest for three days, do nothing. And, the, you know, we all know, you know, everybody that works with chronic pain patients knows that um, inactivity is one of the worst things you can do. So if people treat chronic pain as they would acute pain, you've got a problem. You know, if that's the only strategy you have. So. Um, you know, working on your psychological flexibility gives you so many more strategies, you know, and you, you start to develop um, these strategies.
Maybe a couple of more um, things I can say about acceptance and commitment therapy. So what is acceptance really? It's not, you know, just, all right, now accept the chronic pain and move on. Um, it's really about being open to something that is unpleasant because it's the most human thing to do to not want to accept something that is unpleasant, to want to see it as a problem that needs to be solved. But you cannot solve this problem. That's the problem. It's not a problem that can be solved. So that means it's a really good idea to accept only the thing that cannot be changed anymore. But at the same time, it means how can we change the things that can still be changed? So managing chronic pain is possible. Not having chronic pain probably is not possible, at least based on what science knows at the moment. Uh, one of the um, differences from the traditional CBT in uh, ACT is that we do not change um, thoughts, thought processes that are unhelpful for managing chronic pain, uh, but we try to diffuse it. Um, so we diffuse from these cognitions that are unhelpful and that uh, prevent healthy behaviors. So for example, if uh, you have a patient that says, well, I'm not really going to go for a walk today, even though my physiotherapist recommends it, I'm not going to go because it's raining outside. So in traditional CBT, you would probably, you know, try to see a more, um, maybe other version of this thought and say something like, um, I really, it's, it would be really good for me to, to go for a walk in spite of the rain. The problem many times that, that can work, that approach can work, uh, and does work for a lot of people, but sometimes it does not work because this rational response, um, is not really completely effective because you engage in this thought a lot and then you just spin those thoughts and it doesn't really get you to, to your goal. You know, it doesn't, it's not something that gets you to the goal of walking in rain. What can be really effective in getting you to walk in spite of rain is, okay, I have this thought of not going for a walk because of rain. I'm just going to say thanks to this thought and I'm just going to go and walk. So the focus is different. The focus is not on the thought you diffuse from the thought and you focus on the one thing that is your goal, that is going for a walk. Um, so what this really does is acceptance and cognitive diffusion can lead a person, can help the patient to really engage in activities that serve their goals and desires in life. And uh, that's a process that we call a values, value-based action. All right, so we're uh, approaching the, the finish of this lecture. And uh, maybe by now you can see that I like to tell stories. So I'm going to tell you one last story and then I'm done, promise. Um, so the story is, uh, this winter I managed to sprain my ankle. Uh, it was the only day that uh, there was this huge amount of snow. And usually I cycle to work. And that day I really could not. So I was walking home from work and um, I stepped in a, in a sort of clumsy way and I sprained my ankle, sp sprayed my ankle and uh, I could still walk. So I knew it, it wasn't that bad, but it was, it was painful. So this is how the story goes. Obviously I felt some acute pain or as I prefer to call it, acute pain. But I was really only bothered by lowered functions. So I, you know, I, like I said, I cycled to work every day and that was a little more difficult then. Uh, I still did it though. And uh, I also exercise in a gym three times a week. So that, that became a problem because certain movements, it was really difficult for me to do. So um, for, uh, for um, 10 sessions, I worked with this wonderful physiotherapist and everything went just fine. It went well. 
we connected on some level, a very nice guy. And um, in a couple of months, I was pain free and I was fully functional. And that's the end of the story. It's a very short and quite boring story. And that's the point. Because, and this is my final thought, definitely stories of chronic pain and physiotherapists are much longer and uh, much more complex. And uh, this is how biopsychosocial stories tend to be, because they have many more challenges or problems, however you want to call it, that needs to be overcome. But uh, when we go through these challenges together, our connections also run deeper and longer. And at the very least, that makes such stories far more interesting than my sprained ankle story is. So maybe this is a time for you to start thinking about your own stories, again, uh, about chronic pain patients and working with them. And uh, if you want to share your experience or maybe have some thoughts about this or questions about this lecture, you are very much welcome to drop me a line. Thank you very much.